Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The RSA believes that all should have the freedom and power to turn their ideas into reality. And we are increasingly placing this notion at the heart of uh, everything we are doing at the RSA. Now, this graph shows that something very significant happened around about 1750, 1800. Because what this graph shows is what happened to world GDP per capita. It's a way of measuring, of course, the value of all the things that we produce. And you can see that at some point in the 18th century, our capacity to generate things of value just went through the roof. If you place that in even wider historical context, it's even more amazing. So this is a graph going back millennia based on estimates of what the world was actually producing per person throughout history. Now we know what happened at that time, and it happened in this country, of course. It was the uh, Industrial Revolution. In fact, the Industrial Revolution never stopped. Our capacity to generate things of value has just kept on increasing, and it's had huge impact on our lives. So what happened at that point around 1750 to bring about this revolutionary change? No one is completely sure what the conditions were. But what we do know, that what that changing conditions allowed was for a very fundamental human characteristic to flourish in a way that it hadn't in the past, and that is creativity. And that's something, of course, that is not specific to any historic period. It's something inherent to us as humans. The capacity to imagine a different world and make that different world happen. And that's what was unleashed at that point. But it still was, in many ways, quite an elite revolution for most of the period of the last 200, 250 years. It's been a revolution that was led by technicians. Of course, entrepreneurs have been at the heart of it, a select group of people, sort of heroic business types who spot an opportunity and transform uh, the business environment. Investors, of course, have played an enormous part. And even politicians have played their part or tried to play their part in this huge flourishing of creativity and uh, greater capacity to generate value. And that's what brings us to Lee Felsenstein. Lee was a computer engineer in the 1960s. And he had a big idea. And his big idea was that this new thing that was at the heart of this long industrial revolution, computing power, shouldn't just belong to corporations. This great computing power, this huge creative resource, actually should be available to everyone. And he ultimately became the convener of this group of people, which is the Homebrew Computer Club, which was operating in the mid-1970s and was this rather chaotic group of people who shared Lee's vision. Maybe most importantly, though, the Homebrew Computer Club is where this computer genius, Steve Wozniak, was inspired to pursue the idea of developing home computing. He ultimately met this guy, Steve Jobs, who was by no means a computing genius, but was certainly a business genius. And they together produced this, the Apple II, the first breakthrough computer which began to appear in people's homes and schools and offices. And we know what the result of that is. In the last 40 years or so, it has been a complete transformation in the way we go about being creative. Through things like, obviously, the internet, iPhones, Twitter, email, etc. people now publish online. They publish songs, they publish articles, they publish books, they even publish sentences through Twitter. 
in ways we couldn't have even imagined five uh, or so years ago. Consumers are now getting involved in designing their own products, of course, in ways that are completely transformationary to all sorts of markets. And we know that over the next five to 10 years, this revolution is coming to areas like manufacturing, energy production, that will be just as disruptive as what has happened in, for example, the music business or the publishing industry. And I think the way we can summarize that is to say that we no longer distribute <coughs> just the products of creativity across the world's population, we now distribute creativity itself, which is a radical shift in this industrial revolution that's been going on for the last 250 years. No longer is the creation of value a purely elite uh, activity. It's now something we're all directly involved in. So we're calling that the power to create. And the reason we think that is so central because we think this new technology and the huge appetites there is out there to use that technology makes this vision possible for the first time. And there's great upside to this. First upside is the potential for human fulfillment. And when we are creative, we feel enormously fulfilled. We feel like we have meaning in our lives in a way that very few activities give us the same sense of fulfillment. But there's also, of course, huge economic and social potential. Going back to that graph, if that creativity can be shared much more widely, then who knows where that graph will go over the next 50, 100, 200 years. But we also know there are some serious blockages to the operation of this power to create. Public services, crucial part of our economy, we know are often very resistant to the sort of mass creativity that's happening uh, in other areas. But equally in the private sector, there are sectors of our economy that are dominated by large businesses with rather old fashioned business models, which they seem to find it very difficult to break away from, and which smaller, more innovative players, more creative players drawing on mass creativity find it hard to break into in any significant way. There's also a downside to the power to create we need to keep in mind. And the main one of those is economic and social disruption. Yes, there's been huge long-term benefits from the industrial revolution of the last 250 years, but that was often at the expense of enormous short-term and medium-term disruption. Periods of high unemployment, periods where many businesses failed, real human cost to this as technology wrought enormous disruption. So that means power to create isn't just an idea and an aspiration, it's also a big challenge. And that's in two parts. Firstly, how do we dismantle the blockages in our private and public sector organizations to allow this new wave of mass creativity to really flourish? And secondly, how do we address the downside of economic and social disruption without weakening the upside of greater human fulfillment and economic and social progress. In our work around the power to create, um, our team has collectively come up with a change aim to champion a shift in power to people and communities so that they can better meet their social and economic needs and aspirations. And while a lot of work is going on in this area in public services, I'd say that there's still a real requirement for big change. And I think that's substantive system change. You know, that's public service reform, it's devolution of power, it's more creative approaches to service design, more co-production, and a real attempt to address prevention rather than demand management, or man managing demand as it is. Now, to much maligned public service practitioners, that can sound like a, you know, I'm, I'm waving a stick at them. I have two thoughts on the resistance to change narrative. Um, one is that I don't think that public service practitioners would see themselves as resistant to change. They'd say they've probably faced an onslaught of change, actually, in recent years. I think that actually that's a different kind of change than the kind of change the power to create is talking about. Um, this is the stuff that is handed down from on high, saying you must change because we have to cut this budget or something. And there is a, there is a need to, to see that not everything needs disruptive innovation. There are some things that need to stay stable. But 
System innovation is really what we're talking about. And this is a fundamental change. It's not, and it's not just a change of mindset. It's not just about saying to public sector, sector practitioners, go on, just be different. Um, it actually, you know, collaborative approaches bring with them real problems. Um, if we're going to co-design new systems, you could find different public service practitioners working together and the benefits accrue somewhere else in the system. And that's really problematic because you're effectively making yourselves obsolete. So how do you do that? How do you, have, how do you work with that change? And especially if the checklist is, how do, how do I meet my targets in a PBR environment, in a payment by results environment, if I'm trying to actually shift the discussion to a preventative agenda rather than um, managing the demand that we already have? So I would say that there is a big culture change and the areas that I would suggest that we look at are risk and sort of radically thinking about systems. If you ask a local authority if they're risk averse, many would say, no, not at all. We're really up for innovation. And so you say, OK, so where, where do you want to take that innovation then? Well, digital, definitely, definitely want to go innovation there. Public realm, let's do something interesting in the public realm. OK, so what about adult social care? Oh, no, ooh, mm, a bit risky. What about children's services? Oh, good God, no. Um, the big human problems that we ca carry the most risk, but that's really probably where the real need for innovation is. And so how are we innovating in these areas which are just really risky? And they hold real personal accountability issues. Risks taken in these areas are often led when you are at the service level by passionate individuals and they take it upon themselves to do that creative work, to be the amazing teacher who changes the lives of the children and to be the, the care worker who stays on because the person really needs that chat because the loneliness is really important that we counter that. But they take that upon themselves, they take it at their own cost and that's what's known as practitioner burden and probably where the real creativity in, in public service happens is it's led by practitioner burden at the moment and that's not sustainable sustainable. Therein lies the path to burnout and the path to exiting the profession. We're not going to stay in a profession that continuously puts it upon me to pay for those issues rather than actually it being a systemic supportive culture that allows me to be creative. So to radically shift power to people and not just cut the budget and expect the community to fill the gap, which I think some, some service provision is thinking, oh, we can just cut that and then local people will come and run that skate park. Um, we must cultivate an experimental culture with the acknowledgement that some things will fail. And that's really, really, really difficult. In public services, there's not exactly a supportive culture sometimes like that to, su to support that. But I would really say that big change needs to be ambitious. It needs to be some systemic in scale and revolutionary. And I think we're, we're, we're tinkerers here at the RSA. We're trying to, to trial some of these things in service provisions, in a PBR environment. But I would say system change is absolutely critical. It's not just the little bits of, of tinkering. Alongside the story of economic growth, there is another story, and it's about institutional change and development. John Stuart Mill said, a great nation requires, first, a large variety of character, and second, full play for human nature to expand itself in numberless and even conflicting directions. So, if you like, that's the essence of creativity. I would add to John Stuart Mill, everyone included in this endeavour. So I would add the power and inclusivity dimension to that. And then we have something which I think encapsulates the power to create quite nicely. And we've seen this sort of expand through time, as Adam described. Um, the early industrialization had its change of consciousness, change in technology, and change in institutions as people were moved from the land through enclosure, were moved into the cities through um, the poor law and Spenham land and so on. So we had a great migration of people to, to cities. It continued in the mid 19th century, where you see the introduction of the Joint Stock Companies. The Joint Stock Companies Act was in um, 1844, limited liability in 1855. So the institutional changes go alongside these sort of transformative changes we're seeing in culture, society and economy. By the early 20th century, um, you've seen change in Prussia and Germany under Bismarck, but then you start to see change in the US as well um, under um, Teddy Roosevelt and to a lesser extent in the UK as big corporate powers are starting to be challenged. You see the rise of what Teddy Roosevelt um, described as a new nationalism, obviously speaking in, in a time before the horrors of the, the, the 20th 
20th century. This continues at pace into the fourth transformation. Um, the um, Franklin Roosevelt reforms um, congregated around the New Deal, which have changed the relationship between people and work and labour and companies and finance. Um, in the UK, of course, you have um, the creation of the welfare state and national health service and so on. So you see this big transformative change again, consciousness, technology change is continuing at pace, institutional change is continuing. Then you have a sort of semi-change in the 1960s with the sort of social rights uh, revolution, and most particularly seen in the US, but obviously France, Europe, UK um, as well. Um, and by the 1970s, Globalisation is really taking its pace. The Bretton Woods system um, ends, it collapses. We have this sort of disembedded liberalism, this sort of free market global um, liberalism. So all these changes have happened and at a seemingly, seemingly sort of regular pace every few decades or so. And I think we're in one of those periods of change now um, as well. But what we don't seem to have the capacity to do very effectively is discuss what are the institutional creativity um, that we need to institute in order to make sense of these times and ensure um, that there is diversity, that there is um, sort of unbound human capacity and people are included as well. This time um, is characterised by a kind of disintermediation. And we see this in business, in public services, as Rowan has described. I think we're starting to see some of the change. I mean, this week, the head of um, NHS England um, talks about investing billions of pounds in sort of personal accounts for people to control their own sort of long-term care when they have chronic conditions. And part of that is bringing in the third sector to give them advice on how they can interface um, with the services that they, that they use. So the change is already happening. So all these sort of tools and platforms change the way that we, we, we interrelate and, 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 and we engage. And finally, there's politics. And Barack Obama had this, this wonderful phrase back in 2008 when he was cool. Um, we are the people that we have been waiting for. It's a very powerful uh, phrase. And I think politics is kind of in the Steve Jobs um, garage tech stage of, of development. Um, but politicians and political parties are increasingly being cut out of the story. And I think we'll see that accelerate over uh, the coming decades. So in answer to um, Adam's key question, um, which is um, how can we ensure that we limit the social and economic disruption of these changes? I think the answer is we need to get very creative with institutions. We need power to create institutions that will relentlessly focus on how people can become, in Matthew Taylor's phrase, authors of their own lives, collaboratively. I'm just going to quickly outline three sets of institutions um, that I think will be needed. Um, one is new welfare and work institutions that help people make the change from one type of career to another. That doesn't um, treat them um, or almost in a criminal fashion when they get out to work, but helps support them and get them back up on their feet again. Uh, and I don't think our welfare and work system does that. Two, um, we need new civic supports. There has to be a vibrant democracy that lives outside of the formal democratic structures. The tools are there. We need the conveners. We need the leaders, leaders as, as, as teachers and conveners, um, rather than people that make decisions on our behalf. And finally, we need new ways of pursuing inclusive growth. We need ways of weaving people into the firms that they work for, ensure that they have the asset ownership that they need, so they have some control over their own lives and have some security in lives, so they have the courage to be really creative. And I think then we can mitigate some of the changes that we're seeing. Last month uh, in the news, obviously is an indicator that was very particularly newsworthy. Uh, they talked about a 6.8% rise in high street consumption. And this idea that actually this became a kind of indicator of economic stability. And I was thinking, well, you know, this is only part, the products are only part of the story. And actually what we're trying to do in the design department here and the way that we're thinking about our change aims, which is about making and about the kind of understanding of local city productivity and the way that business as usual cannot continue. And this kind of interesting of going from something that's very, very linear and kind of feels slightly as though we've got the foot stuck on the accelerator. We're just sort of hurtling it very fast in one way, this very linear production system. How can we then start considering where creativity can actually disrupt that and change the way that we, we're moving in that or putting helping to actually either change the pathway or thinking about the, the uh, taking our foot off the pedal? 
So our kind of reframing has been really about starting at the end. I mean, a lot of our program around the, specifically around the work that I've been doing in the Great Recovery Program, has been about taking people who are creative and mixing them and networking them, people who don't consider themselves to be creative, but giving them, empowering them to think like that. And we have been taking these people to facilities where all this stuff, all this production, industrial revolution products end up and saying to them, well, take something off that waste pile and take it apart. Because all of these products have huge amount of resource in them. All of this stuff is showing us that actually the model that we have currently, that we're keep keeping going on, this really can't carry on. Why can't that carry on this linear process? It's because we have increased volatility of price, prices of these raw materials that go into our products. We have big strain in terms of developing middle classes. Um, globally that, are, that want more high-tech products. We have this demand, this insatiable demand for like more and more high-tech and we just can't carry on like that. So for us, it's really about um, this challenge of the fact that uh, we can't carry, we have to start designing products or unleashing the power to create, to think about our systems and our product design that means that it's fit for future, that we don't have to go back to the dark ages of sitting in caves and with candles and no lighting, etc. but actually we are moving forward in a very uh, responsive way. And I think the conclusion of that is that the things that we've discovered around that is that everything is connected and people need to be connected. So if you want to go back to the kind of um, this idea of dismantling blockages, it's about um, how can disruption happen and how can we unleash that creativity that we have discovered through the Great Recovery is through networking. And it's not just networking in one silo, it's about all silos, and, but really understanding who is responsible for what part. So, Unleashing the power is about understanding your expertise, but also understanding who else holds knowledge that you need to get hold of. It's also about um, creativity being a collaborative venture. So understanding that this empowerment to question, to fail, very, very important to acknowledge failure in your system and then be have an iterative design process around it so you can redesign your products and your systems. Um, and also about disruption. So disruption we see is a very, very crucial part of the power to create because we see that um, business as usual doesn't shift things. It's, it does incremental, not, not so bad changes, but if we want to have real shift towards things like a circular econ economic system, we have to have those massive shifts. And those shifts are not next day. They are 30 year systems. You know, we're talking generational changes. So it's about broadening vision to see the whole picture of things and making sure that you have the right people around you to do that in order to dismantle blockages.